97.3 ESPN presents the Sports Bash with Mike Gill. It's time for Football at Four with Jeff Mosier. My personality is I, I want to win badly. I want to win more Lombardis for Philadelphia and our fans. we got the greatest fans around, and I will do everything possible. Powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios. This is Football at Four. And Football at Four is powered by the Inside the Birds podcast, and it's brought to you by Dr. Lyle M. Back for everything from skin care to cosmetic surgery. Go to ilovelyleback.com or call 856-MAKEOVER for Dr. Lyle M. Back, proud sponsor of Football at Four. I heard we should have got a snowblower sponsor for you there, Moshe. I've heard you got to dust off the snowblower yesterday. How many times you use that thing? Only once, Mike, only once, but it was the first time I've used it, and it's three years old, so kind of lets you know. Yeah, that's a shame. Well, How did you, it, it, no, it's kind of funny because yesterday he was talking about the snowblower. I said, it's funny you bring that up because Mosh texted me and said he hasn't even used – you said, I finally can use my new snowblower that I got three years ago, and he's ripping all these people well, that said, get sucked into the snowblower. I said, How did, you're a smart guy. How did you get sucked into buying a snowblower living in this area? Well, first of all, I didn't buy it. I got it as a gift. Oh, okay. So I, and it, as most suckers go, you just when you get something as a gift, you don't have to. That's a great gift. You don't have to worry about that's a great gift. It, so, if yeah, somebody yeah. gives you that gift, that's a great gift. All right, so this changes everything then. All right. Yeah, absolutely. You, go. you got a free thing that you didn't. You know, it's now it's a luxury. It's like taking a tight end at number six. It's a luxury <laughs> thing. Now, most, do you help out the neighbor next door with the snowblower? If you see them shoveling, you go, hey, uh, Nancy, I got you. Don't worry about it. Or, hey, Jim, it's on me. You, you go drink your coffee. I, def- I, sh- I did snowblow not only the, the sidewalk in front of my house, but as, uh, my, both of my neighbors as well. That's, see, now, that's a good point. The fact that you are the guy on the block that got the snowblower, you got to go around snowblowing everybody's front yard. I do feel that responsibility. I'm willing to take it on. They say with great power <laughs> and great machinery comes great responsibility. So, All right, Jeff. Uh, I mean, obviously, there's a lot to dive into today. Uh, last night, Jalen Hurts spoke. He was uh, talking a little bit about the quarterback situation. He was a little vague. Jalen Mills also spoke today. I don't want to say he was a little bit more clear, but he did give a little bit more of an indication those two guys have talked. One guy who hasn't talked is Went. So I want to ask you, now that the dust has settled on this golf deal and everything is kind of, you know, there was eight teams that called them, do you feel any differently about Wentz's position or the Eagles' team position on where this whole thing kind of stands right now? Do I feel differently is a good question. Um, I guess I've always felt all along – that there was this was a very murky situation that didn't seem to have a it didn't seem to teeter one way or another heavily toward comeback or not comeback. But I will say that Carson still being silent throughout a coaching change has shown you that his grievances with the organization were not just relegated to Doug Peterson, right? Because if it was just about Doug Peterson, then clearly when Doug Peterson was fired. And when a new coach who was hired, who's been an understudy to Frank Reich, and we know how Carson feels about Frank Reich, you would have thought that would have been the gate opening to Carson wanting to express a desire to return or speak freely now that that Doug Peterson's not here. The fact that Carson remains silent in this situation makes me feel like he still has issues with the organization as a whole that are not just relegated to Doug Peterson, and that if he has these issues and he has these problems, that he's still trying in his way by being silent and doing whatever it is behind the scenes to to move on somewhere else. Right. You and just, at some point, the Eagles have to make that decision of whether they want to do that or not. Right. You just start to think now, was it this prickly relationship between him and Peterson, or is it the entire organization itself that – before, it was like, okay, we're hearing that him and Peterson were having trouble. Okay, we'll eliminate Peterson. Well, now it's almost, okay, Peterson's gone, and he still hasn't really said anything. Maybe it was more than just Doug Peterson. Yeah, and I don't think that they fired Doug Peterson. I mean, I know they didn't die, 
fired Doug Peterson because of Carson Wentz. I, you know, I know some people felt that that was going to, to appease that was him. their solution. Right, right, to appease him, correct. Nor did they hire Nick Sirianni, per se, because they felt he was the best person to fix Carson Wentz. I don't believe that to be true either. I, I think these are just happen, things that moves that have been made with the Carson Wentz issue still hovering around them. So clearly they've got to come to some kind of decision soon, you would think, as to what they want to do, how they want to approach the situation. Do they want to have a guy who's not happy still be on the roster and try to hope that it works itself out, or do they want to make a move? This is clearly not the same level as what happened with Pittsburgh, but with Antonio Brown, it just ended up being so much. It's like, we got to get rid of this guy no matter what the cap hit is. Like, at what point are the Eagles in the same position where it's, you know what, it's going to be brutal, it's going to be the dead cap hit, but enough is enough with this. I don't know how we move forward until this drama is gone. Well, forget Antonio Brown. The Rams just did it with Goff. They just said, we'll take the 20-plus million dead cap hit because we don't think you're good enough. Yeah, you know, and, and in that and, situation, oh, by the way, they were Mosh, able to... Mosh, they did it with Brandon Cooks the year before. They traded him and said, we'll take the dead cap hit because for whatever reason they didn't want him. They got a... The Rams are another team with huge dead cap money. Yeah, no, you make a good point. And in the case of, of Jared Goff, right, I mean, they were getting Matthew Stafford in return. It had already been agreed upon with Matthew and the Lions that they were going to be headed for a divorce and kind of starting over in Detroit. So it was easy. I don't want to say easy, but the Rams had a clear target that they could work with, a partner who was willing to make them a deal that that would make it worthwhile uh, taking that big money hit that they're taking and getting rid of Goff. I don't think it's it's that, uh, you know, cut and dried with the Eagles. I don't know if there's a partner that's willing them to give them something of such great value that they say, all right, well, this is worth taking such a massive cap hit, the biggest in the sports history. That doesn't mean that something won't be done. It just, to me, complicates it a little bit more than, say, the Rams-Detroit trade. So at this point, there's eight teams that made a call for uh, Stafford, right? Does that tell you that that's a positive or a negative for the Eagles, that so many teams are looking for quarterbacks, apparently? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that should work in the Eagles' favor. Um, Obviously, Matthew Stafford, the team wasn't doing well, but it's not like his years, even his down ones, are as bad as the one Carson just had. So it is a little bit different. But I think what helps out the Eagles' case here, if they really do want to move on, uh, is that there? this isn't, uh, I would say, a, a really well-regarded class of quarterbacks. Of course, there's Trevor Lawrence, who's a great prospect, and he'll go number one overall, most likely. But after that, you're starting to get some question marks with Justin Fields, uh, and then the kid from BYU, the kid from North Dakota State. Uh, Adam Kaplan reported on our podcast that dropped this morning that at the Senior Bowl, the consensus was that the quarterbacks there were not you know, knocking anybody's socks off. So it's not like there's going to be five, six, seven quarterbacks that everybody's chasing after. And even the ones that are going to probably go after Trevor Lawrence, the three or four that do probably come with some question marks as well. So if you're a team like the Colts or a team like the Bears, uh, if you're a team that's looking for a quarterback but you're not drafting in the top five, then it probably does make some sense to give the Eagles a call and see what it, what, uh, you know, what it would take to get Carson Wentz. Yeah, and I guess that's the big question. What would it take to get him? I mean, what is the Eagles' expectations? Because knowing the cap, like knowing the dead money hit, would that make you ask for more to make it worth the dead money hit? Or, or are the Eagles at the point where this guy hasn't said anything, we can't get along, we don't need this headache. If someone's going to call us and make a reasonable offer, we'll take it. Yeah, this is how his strong point. Making deals is usually what he does best. Uh, you know, independent of the contract and the dead money is the idea that more than one team might be interested. So if Howie can at least create the perception, if it's not reality, that there are multiple teams that are looking to pry Carson Wentz away, that helps his case as far as getting maximum uh, in return. Now, they just have to, there has to either be that case or teams have to believe it. And honestly, for, for all the reasons we just mentioned, it's pretty believable that, that Howie could get a market of at least two or three teams uh, willing to, to get Carson Wentz. It's just can he create the perception, if not the reality, that these teams are willing to give up 
something of, of great value, like a first or a second round pick. I just think, like about Wentz, how does he win in this situation? This organization committed to a rebuild, brought in all these young coaches, and you're naturally going to have growing pains in that scenario, but he's the most heavily dissected guy in the city right now, and he is demanded to go out there and perform or else he's going to get destroyed. So, like, how do you win if you're Carson Wentz with everything you have on your plate? It's tough right now to come back to the situation and unless you play the best football of your life, because even if you have a bad game, you know how it is around here. There's going to be like, oh, he's not the guy we thought he had a bad game, two picks, bring in Jalen Hurts. And I think that when you put that, when you add that to the equation, Hunter, it, it does make it feel like it, it's time to move on from Carson Wentz irregardless, because this, it's almost like, He's set up to fail here or that he won't be given a fair shot or imagine having to compete Carson Wentz and have to compete for your job, quote unquote, compete for your job next camp. Uh, I do, though, think that other situations are going to be difficult for him too, Hunter, unless he goes to, I, I feel like he'll probably fit better in a small market, less scrutiny. You know, the Indianapolis thing seems to make the most amount of sense because of his relationship with Frank Reich. Sounds like they're bringing Press Taylor in. So will that be the best for him? And his development, I don't know, because some of the issues with Carson are very real. His coachability, his stubbornness, what he has to do to be a better quarterback and what he's willing to embrace. But at least if he went to a different team, a small market, a team like Indianapolis, Indianapolis has a good roster, good offensive line, good running back, good receivers, good defense, good coaches there. So much like last year, what you saw him do in December, I mean last year as of 2019, Maybe he can be the Carson Wentz he wants to be, which isn't perfect, but there's enough around him for him to succeed. Uh, Jeff Mosher, Football at Four, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. And, of course, uh, you know, last night Jalen Hurts was on with CBS Sports HQ, and he was asked, you know, kind of took a diplomatic approach, but he was asked who starts, and he says, that's a great question. I'll tell you that I'm putting the work in on my end, trying to build those relationships with my guys. I'm excited for this offseason, just excited to take that next step. So regardless of what's what, I'm challenging myself to be the best quarterback I could be, learn from my mistakes, learn from my mistakes from last year. Personally, in those four games, I got my opportunity to get my feet wet and take off next year. It's not what he said, but is it the fact that he said something that says, I'll be the leader of this team. I'll speak up and say something. I mean, you ask me about it, I'll at least talk about it. Yeah, I think that's been pretty consistent with Jalen. He came in as a guy who was highly regarded for being a leader, for handling the situation that he handled at Alabama very well. The benching, he stayed, he competed, he tried to beat out to it, didn't work. I know that there's this knock that, you know, he's, a, he's just like Carson Wentz because he transferred, so he quit. No, he stayed there and tried to compete for the job. It wasn't until... He lost out again to Tua that he wasn't going to be the quarterback. Then he went to Oklahoma, obviously was a Heisman uh, finalist there. And so he came to the Eagles with, with quite a pedigree of being a leader, uh, of being a type A as a quarterback, everything that you want in a quarterback as far as leadership and intangibles and things like that. The, the, the question is now, guys, is that you're dealing with a, a totally new and fresh set of eyes uh, in, in judging him, at least from a coaching standpoint, Nick Sirianni and his staff, we have no idea how they feel about what they saw when they went, uh, as they're watching tape, how they feel about it in Jalen Hurts. And then also what we're, we're dealing with, if Carson Wentz is not going to be here, uh, what kind of competition are you getting? You already have the number six overall pick. Will Howie and Howie and Jeffrey decide that it's, it's imperative to put that those resources back into finding another quarterback or, or are they sold that Jalen hurts is the guy. I think there are a lot of meetings and discussions and conversations that have to be had. Um, but certainly if you're Jalen hurts, you're going to operate under the assumption that you're going to be given every single chance to win that starting job next year. My question is, do you think that the team set that interview up, or did somebody get him around the team? Why would Jalen Hurts be granted an interview um, to speak in that situation? What's the message there? Yeah, we'll let Hurts speak. I mean, to me, I thought that was the most interesting part of, like, who got Hurts? Who let him talk before Wentz got a chance to say anything? It's a good question, Mike. I, I don't know that the team even knew that he was doing the interview. Perhaps they did. I don't know what avenues CBS went through. They could have gone through the agent. This is the Super Bowl week, and I know that there's 
Probably there's no radio row, right? At Super Bowl, this, there is this a radio week, row, but it's very scary. Well, real, I think real quick, he's like speaking. He's speaking again tonight with um with Kay Adams on Instagram Live. Uh, the NFL just tweeted that out tonight at eight o'clock. Right. So he will be speaking again tonight. Wow. So he must well, that's what I was getting at. Even though that that radio row may not look like what it normally looks, this is the week normally where you would see everybody who's anybody in the NFL doing their interviews, pitching their products, working with so and forth and so on. So it doesn't really surprise me that Jalen Hurts uh, this week has a couple of interviews lined up, but I also don't make, I don't put any stock as this is something that the team is trying to do to get him front and center uh, to send any kind of messages. Well, Jalen Mills was also talking away on the same platform, and he says that he thinks they should let Wentz and Hurts battle it out for the starting job. So now he's a free agent. He's not definitively back with the Eagles. But now you have somebody coming out and saying, I think they should battle it out. Like there's, you don't want to pick sides, but now you're almost telling the team, you can't just give this job to Carson Wentz. I think they got a mess on their hands coming here, man. I mean, there's certainly the locker room sentiment that you'd have to factor in to what, and uh, like Hunter was saying before, is it, is it, can he come back to this locker room and still have the same respect from his teammates? Well, let's ask. That he's had? Let's ask this hypothetically, Jeff Hunter. Would you want to come back after all this, whether you loved it here or not? Would you want to come back? You said it, Jeff. The minute he doesn't play a good game, he has an average game. They're going to call for Hurts. I mean. This guy's in a no-win. You're almost like you almost feel bad for him, but like you don't want to feel bad for him. But it's like he's in a no-win situation. He the only way he can win people back is to be the 20s, even if he's the 2018 or 19 version of himself. That won't be good enough. Yeah, you know, there's two two ways to look at that, Mike. You can certainly struggle here and be under the gun and come back, kind of like the way Michael Vick did when Chip Kelly became head coach, because certainly Vick had struggled those last two years, gotten hurt, Foles had taken over at the end of his, his final year of Andy's career, but he was able to come back and, and at least try to repair it because it was a new coaching staff and, and the criticism that Michael had taken, he was able to handle it, but he wasn't looked at in the locker room differently. I think that might be an issue for Carson Wentz here. But to answer your question, like if you were to take that out, I mean, Carson Wentz does have, you know, 20 some odd million reasons to want to come back and play and play well here because once the trade is made, the guaranteed money drains, you know, he gets the guaranteed money, but what about the rest of the contract? Because once that trade is made, he's essentially operating on a one-year deal where a team can cut him afterwards. So it's good that he got all that guaranteed money, but there's a lot of money left on the contract with the Eagles. So it's financially best for him to come back to this team, play well, and see all that money that is not guaranteed that is in the contract that he can't assure, assure himself going forward with another team. Yeah, I mean, we are heavily focused on the Wentz angle, which makes sense. But, like, if you're Jalen Hurts, what are you possibly thinking? Like, does it matter what I do? Like, like this guy's just possibly going to get handed the job back while I deserve it. I mean, I, I'm sure a lot of backups feel that way. Like, hey, I want a chance and all that. But this is so unique and so different. Does it even matter what he thinks, though? Does it matter about his perspective? Because money talks, and this league is all about the business side of things. Yeah, not really, Hunter, to be fair. I mean, he's a second-round pick. He was, what, one and three, and not that quarterback is a, is a, a Windsor as a quarterback stat. He played – he was a flash player who flashed at times and then obviously did not play well in the last two games at other times. And I don't think he has any right to say that I should be handed the starting job, much like going back to when Chip Kelly took over in 2013. You brought back Mike Vick. You brought back Nick Foles. You called it a, a quarterback competition, even though it really wasn't. It was always going to be Michael Vick's job. Um, but it's not like Nick had deserved anything because he finished out that last year, that disastrous year. I think they, they were one in five, even though he played decently in some of those games. And I think it was the Tampa game that he won on a touchdown pass to Jeremy Macklin uh, at the last second. I think that was that year. But the, the, the bottom line was he, he didn't deserve anything. He, just, he was a third round pick as a rookie. He was put into a situation. So Jalen Hurts should only be concerned with reporting to OTAs, ready to go know the offense, ready to improve on last year. And if he's good enough, good things will happen for him. Uh, Jeff Mosher from the Inside the Birds podcast. One of the topics you guys hit on um, was uh, Lane Johnson. It was like a forgotten guy. What do we know about Lane and his health and where he's at 
uh, for the 2021 season. Because one of the things I've said on the show is, you get Lane Johnson and Brandon Brooks back, you got a different look on your offensive line. We just had Bryant McKinney on, and he kind of echoed that, like, it's not easy to have a new guy next year every single week. Like, I can understand why that would be a problem. Well, the Eagles are hoping they don't only have two guys playing next to each other. They get two pretty good guys playing next to each other. But what's the status of, of Lane? Yeah, it sounds like uh, everything is positive. Uh, Adam Kaplan reported on the, the podcast that we dropped this morning that he's uh, either off of his scooter or supposed to be off it soon and has been feeling great in his comeback. We know how difficult last year was. He had a very late surgery. It was the tightrope surgery that impacted how he was able to prepare. And then in the middle of the year, he, he made a comment when he got hurt for good that the ankle kind of imploded on him or collapsed on him. It was something that sounded very gruesome uh, for an ankle injury. I'd never heard that kind of terminology used before. So he had to undergo another surgery. Thankfully, the surgery he's gotten, it's past him. He should have, you know, up until training camp to continue to rehab on it. We'll see if he's ready for training camp. But that should the fact that he was able to get this taken care of, um, unfortunately, it helped kind of corrupt this past season. But at least he should be good to go by the time next season is, uh, is, is starts and, and you get your anchor right tackle back. Good stuff. Uh, check that out. More detail from the guys at the Inside the Birds podcast, which dropped today. I want to get your opinion real fast, Mosh, on the last two days we've learned that the Eagles requested no interviews with the Chiefs guys. The enemy, Kafka. Any particular reason in your mind why they were not interested in either one of those guys? Two names who seemingly were at the top of the favorite list when this process started. Yeah, that one's been tough to figure out. There's a little bit of a conspiracy theorist in me that um, that people seem to think that the Eagles weren't interested in those two guys, and I wonder if they didn't ask because they were already told those two guys were not interested in them. You know, I don't know that for a fact. That's just me kind of throwing it out there. But obviously, the last guy from Kansas City who went over to the Eagles just got fired after he went to the playoffs three times and won a Super Bowl. So clearly, if you're coming from that chain – you have a little bit more inside knowledge on how that how that organization works uh, than maybe a guy like Nick Sirianni or other people. And so um, I don't know what happened there. I don't know why they weren't interviewed. I have a hard time thinking the Eagles suddenly don't want someone from the Andy Reid chain, which has been not only good for them, but also around the NFL. But I have less of a hard time believing that the Kansas City chain looks a little uh, at the Eagles situation with a side eye. Yeah, you wonder if McDermott and Reed got together and said, let's bar any of our assistants from going to play for Howie Roseman. That could be a conspiracy theory. That's a good one. That's, I like that. We should all run for Congress. Yes, yes. All right, the Inside the Birds podcast dropped this morning. Is this the last week for Monday, Wednesday, Friday? Or are you guys still Monday, Wednesday, Friday? Uh, we will be Monday, Wednesday, Friday this, this week. Uh, after that, we do switch into off-season mode, and we will be dropping Monday and Thursday at 6 a.m. Monday, Thursday, 6 a.m. starting next week. But every day, football at 4. Free agency is coming. We will be all over that. The draft, we've already started to touch on that with Andrew a little bit. Um, what, what would you think if the Eagles took a tight end at number 6? Oh, man. You know, I'm best player available. If, they, if, they're, if they're telling you he's the best player that they got on their board. But if you were willing to six. take if you were willing to take a wide out, why would you not then be willing to take a tight end? Well, it just depends because are, are they going to be then play a lot of twelve? I would hope that if they did that, then they were well, going to be Sirianni, a twelve personnel didn't he team. Say, didn't he tell Spadaro that he would prefer playing twelve personnel? That's his style. You know what he said in Indianapolis. They liked it when they had some good pass catching tight ends, but they also had injuries at the wide receiver position. But if you go look at last year, they were more of an 11 personnel team than a 12 personnel team. Yeah. So, and I don't know if that's because some of their tight ends got hurt. I know, you know, Mo Ali, Ali Cox did get hurt for a little bit, but then they also had Pittman that they drafted. They had T.Y. Hilton, who was hurt a little bit. It seems like they were a lot like the Eagles going back and forth between 11 and 12. But if this kid's going to be a, a playmaker, I'm just, I just look at it weird because it seems like the history of taking a tight end in the top 10 does not normally work out for teams. No, Rich Kotite took uh, Kyle Brady when he had Johnny Mitchell. It didn't work oh, out. Oh, I remember. <laughs> didn't work out very good. All right, uh, check out the Inside the Birds podcast. The latest edition dropped today. And, um, you know, by the way, someone just commented on the uh, stream. I'll pop it up there for you, both so you can see it. But uh, Marquise Goodwin, do you know his status? 
It's a great question. Well, I'm going to dig into that a little bit more. Didn't he come on a one-year deal? Yeah, but if you opted out, did that mean that you the, – the contract – what's the status of a contract on an opt-out? I'll look into that. Next time we're on, um, I will have a better answer for that question. All right, there you go, Adam. Uh, good question, because this is the third time I've been asked that today, and I'm not sure the status of those contracts of the opt-out people. I know they got paid – but they didn't get paid. They got paid like an opt-out fee. Like it was like here's five hundred thousand for opting out or choosing to opt out. All right, Jeff Bosher, you look right. like you're gonna need to use your slow bl- snow blower. <laughs> Thanks. Do we have zero glitches today? I was right? just zero? about to say that. No glitches. Zero glitches today. I'm back in the same spot. I was doing it with all the glitches, so I don't know. You know, it's funny though because we had that. We were on a Zoom uh, a, a call earlier today. Motion I, I was getting nothing. I didn't see any. There was video streaming, and I got none of it. Like, anytime something, I, I was like. Oh. So, was your Wi-Fi? Apparently for that. It one. must be. It's not me. It's you. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. I invented this. It's not yeah. you. It's me. <laughs> there it is. All right, man. Take care. See you, fellas. All right. He's Jeff Mosher from the Inside the Birds podcast, and it is brought to you by Dr. Lyle M. Back for everything from skin care to cosmetic surgery. Go to ilovelyleback.com, 856 Makeover, or Dr. Lyle M. Back, proud sponsor of Football at Four.